Welcome to the final part of Spinoza's Ethics Explained. If you haven't watched the previous parts, then I have no doubt you'll still get something out of this video, but you'll probably get a whole lot more out of it if you watch the previous parts linked here. This part is the most contested part of ethics, with a lot of people saying that it's a little out of place. And if you stick around, then I think you'll see why. Spinoza says that we don't have free will, or at least not this kind. Can I ask why? Yes, you can. That's the beauty of it. Freedom is instead understanding rationally, or as he puts it, having full, adequate knowledge of our own bodies and the other bodies that we interact with. How exactly does this make us free though? Every event that we see has a cause, which is then the effect for another cause, and on and on to infinity. To infinity and beyond! Spinoza says that the world we see is broken into two streams, running parallel to one another. In one, we have the events in 3D space, and in the other, there's the idea of each event happening in 3D space. These streams directly match up with one another all the time. Imagining the universe as an infinite stream of causes and effects, it begs the question, how did all of this get started? Or what was the first cause? Spinoza calls it God, but as you might know by now, it can also simply be called nature, universe, cosmos, or any other similar term. All of these causes and effects get mixed up with one another, like a big spider web, instead of running in a strictly linear fashion. That's why you don't have free will, because other things are affecting you, so the things that you cause don't flow from yourself alone. Having these rational and adequate ideas is what allows us to determine the order and connection of events in our lives. Following from this, it should be easy to see why Spinoza says that our goal should be to become more rational. Take hatred, for example. This is when you're sad, and you attribute your sadness to someone else. By separating your sadness from the image of the person you hate, you're able to get rid of the hatred, leaving you just sad, which is not really any better than hatred, but at least you're able to understand the feeling adequately, or completely, because the feeling is just related to your body alone, and not something outside of yourself. By doing this, we're able to turn inadequate ideas into adequate ideas, passivity into activity, sadness into joy, evil into virtue, and enslavement into freedom. I don't really have time to go through why this is the case for all of these, but if you've watched the previous videos, then you should understand because they're all sort of interrelated terms. So is Spinoza saying that we can overcome grief after a loved one dies, or even fear whenever you have a gun pointed at your face, purely by understanding the feeling? Seems pretty unrealistic, don't you think? He says some very powerful effects might be impossible to restrain, but even in this case, understanding rationally still helps us manage them. Take fear, for example, where we can act more rationally by separating our feelings from the situation and keeping them under control. We're able to do this best when we understand that everything that has happened is necessary, meaning it had to happen in the way that it did, so we don't feel pride, blame, envy, or pity, and we see that bad things had to be the way that they are, so they don't sadden us. Let's keep exploring this idea of freedom. If everything is necessary, how is it that we're free? Freedom to Spinoza is following your own nature, so acting due to your essence instead of your effects. But that brings up an important question of its own. How is it even possible to try to control the effects if everything is predetermined? Is life really just a book where the ending has already been written and we're just living out the events? To really boil this question down for you, what is the point of doing anything if everything is laid out in advance? Going back to the book analogy, we're not just characters in a book that he's already written. Since God isn't static, and he is self-actualizing, a better analogy would be that God is writing the book as it goes. He is both comprehending all universal events while at the same time actualizing or being those events himself. In this way, we're a part of God, made of him, just on the surface of substance, the stuff that makes up all things, as the infinite chains of cause and effect play out. So it's not the case that no matter what you choose, you'll become a better person because it was your destiny. There's no roadmap already made for your life, nor the world as a whole, as neither have to end up in the same state. Events are determined through your choices, actions, and interactions. Because of this, Spinoza says that freedom is really attainable and is worth striving for. We'll never be 100% free though, because things will always be acting on us, causing us to have different effects flowing from ourselves than from our essence. He recommends that we use our imaginations to create ethical maxims and make these into habits done by focusing on what is virtuous by considering ethical questions, moral rules, practicing good behavior, and other related actions. This leads to more positive experiences, to more joy in activity, so we're more virtuous, rational, and finally, free. 
Spinoza goes on to say that we must love God and that God does not love us. That's a pretty bold statement from a guy considering himself rational. He says this because we're finite modes of God, meaning our bodies and ideas are a part of him. So no idea, when truly understood, can even be conceived without God. This means that the free person understands God to be the cause of his joy, so he therefore loves him. That makes sense, but how can he claim that God doesn't love us? Well, that's because God, or it, doesn't experience the effects, meaning it doesn't have feelings. That means that God doesn't feel jealousy, hatred, or anger. <clears throat> Christianity. But how are we supposed to love God whenever there's atomic bombs, wars, and other atrocities happening throughout the world? Our inability to love every aspect of nature is reflective on our inability to fully understand that everything is necessary. This seems a little contradictory to what we previously went over on why we still have free will in a sense. And is probably why many readers find this final part of the ethics a little out of place. And with that, we've pretty much wrapped up the ethical portion of the book. Now to complete Spinoza's metaphysics, starting with another controversial idea. That being that the mind can exist without the body. Okay, okay, I hear you. After all of this, is Spinoza about to argue that we have souls and that there's an afterlife? Well, in a sense, yes, but not really. The reason he says this lies in his ideas about time. Finite modes like you and I exist durationally, meaning we're bound by time, while substance, attributes, and the immediate modes are eternal. Eternity is existence itself. It can't be conceived by duration of time, not even by comprehending it as duration with no beginning or ending, because that introduces a concept of time. It is best thought about not as an infinite amount of time, but rather as something outside of time itself. So we are finite modes, and therefore we must exist durationally, meaning at some point we're going to die. So how is it that our minds are supposed to live eternally? He actually doesn't make this point very clear, but it's possible that since what we are is a part of not only finite modes, but the mediate modes as well, even after death, our minds are able to play out in these mediate modes. In this way, the parallelism could still remain, but would be pushed back in his metaphysics. That brings the even more interesting question of what exactly were we before we were born? Or said differently, what is the status of finite modes that don't exist yet? The answer to both of these questions comes in understanding what one's essence is. Our essence is a part of the infinite intellect, which must be eternal because it is a part of God who is eternal. By being understood by God, this means that your essence neither implies actual existence at any given time and doesn't have a duration attached to it. This means that God is eternally comprehending the essence of things, regardless of whether they exist durationally or not. So at a specific point in time, it doesn't matter if we actually exist or not, because our essence is being eternally comprehended in the infinite intellect, both before and after we're dead. This isn't your normal afterlife though, because a lot of what you consider to be you will no longer be the same. In this state, you're just an idea of God, meaning you can't have anything relating to duration. This includes images, effects, experiences, and memories. What is left is the idea of the body's relations of motion and rest, defining what the body is capable of. Not quite pearly gates or streets paved with gold. You might still be confused on how a body can die and a mind still lives. Death to Spinoza is just a transformation of being. As your body decomposes back into the earth, its parts change form and are used again. The mind works in a similar way. When destroyed, it gets reintegrated into the infinite intellect, so what remains is the idea of the body as an eternal idea. To wrap up the book, Spinoza says that having an intellectual love of God is knowing and loving all being eternally. This intellectual love and joy comes from knowing one's own essence perfectly and fully through God. To get there, we have to strive to be virtuous and free by meditating on life, not on death. Taking all this in, it's safe to say that the motivation for living well is just living well itself, not the rewards or punishments that we think await us after death. With that being said, now is a perfect time for me to remind you guys to keep thinking deep and living well. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you watched every part of this series, I really can't thank you enough. I never intended for this series to get so long, but there was just so much to cover here. I hope you guys have enjoyed watching these videos as much as I have making them. And I'll see you guys next series.